Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, babies in their diapers, welcome to the Tiberia Show with your host, Tiberius Boy. That's me, Tiberius. Today, we're going to talk about some very awesome stuff. We have a video about Manny and Cannon, a book about a boy that was trained for war from birth, and we have a totally awesome guest. Today we have the one, the only, the amazing, Russell Gaines. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. And Russell is an award-winning author and puzzle maker. Well, I'm glad to be on your show. This is very exciting for me. You're welcome. And today, we're going to start off with the video game of the week, and this is going to be a blast. And now it's time for the video game of the week. Today's video game is Cannon Simulator. So this is a game on the Roblox platform. This game is made by Hero Studios. Because it's on Roblox, you are able to play it on PC, Mac, Xbox, and even your cell phone. And it is free. This is the only game made by Hero Studios. So I enter the game, and you are standing next to a water fountain, and you are next to a cannon. When you move, the cannon moves with you. There are some walls of brick just around the map, and when you walk up to it, your cannon attacks the wall and breaks it down. Jeez. Well, each time you collapse a wall, you get coins. These coins can be used at the shop to purchase things like upgrades or a better cannon. You can even buy eggs. And you know what the eggs are for. Those will give you pets which can improve and upgrade your, your stats. And as always, everything will cost you coins to upgrade. Now the pet should give you a multiplier to your damage. After you have some good pets, you can then upgrade your location. There are a number of locations like the spawn area, beach, city, ocean, candy, space, and like 20 other levels. My dad tried it and was not impressed. He said it was very boring and you just stand there and wait for your cannon to do all the work for you. Well, I give Cannon Simulator 7 out of 10 stars because it was nice to explore the other areas and what they have for your cannon to attack. I made it to the city. Oh yeah! See, Kevin Smith, law.com. You can call him at 407 801 2667. Wait, you are not Chuck. My dad can help when people get hurt. He loves to help people. If you are ever injured at work or in a car accident, you should call my friend Chuck. You can call him at 407 801 2667. That website again is cwsmithwall.com. Offices, Orlando. Does it actually have that much W's? <laughs> And now it's time for the Book of the Week, Ender's Game. Since you are an amazing author, I worked hard to find an awesome book worthy of reviewing with you. Ender's Game was written by Orson Scott Card. Numbers at the back of the book. In fact, Russell, would you like to do the honors? I would be honored. <clears throat> Intense is the word for Ender's Game. Aliens have attacked Earth twice and almost destroyed the human species. To make sure humans win the next encounter, the world government has taken to breeding military geniuses and then training them in the arts of war. The early training, not surprisingly, takes the form of games. Ender Wigan is a genius among geniuses. He wins all the games. But is he smart enough to save the planet? This is an app book that is worth 16 points. Created for fifth grade and fifth month. This is an amazing book, and it was even a New York Times, New York Times bestseller. Jeez. <laughs> now I have started on this book because one of my guests gave it to me. Tom Ross was a blind lawyer that I interviewed over a year ago, and he wanted me to read this book. He took it off his bookshelf and told me to read it. It took me two weeks to read the book. It's one of the largest books that I've ever read. It is about this kid named Ender, and he is born on purpose. He was trained to play games where he could defend Earth from aliens that were attacking soon. He was trained for war in war games. He was often bullied at school. 
There were very few rules. Kids said bad words and fought often. Andrew defended himself and hurt his aggressor badly. Andrew was selected for the most elite training, where he could learn to be a commander. He was not afraid to take risks and would defend himself. He was trained in lots of video games where he would battle aliens almost every day. Then, it was going to be the time for the biggest battle of all. But, you know, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to give away the story. Good you idea. Should, mm -hmm. You should also really go read this book. I give Ender's Game 20 out of 10 stars because I enjoyed the reveal at the end and was so surprised that I could even read the book that was that large. I can't wait to read the next book in the series and maybe even watch the movie. You know, that made me think of one thing. When, when, uh, when you said that, the difference between a book and a movie. Because I love this book, and it's just an okay movie. Because when they take a book and they turn it into a movie, they have to show lots of things that you expect to see when you go to a movie. You have to see ships and explosions and people running here and there and, and costumes. And that's all in the book. But in the book, there's all sorts of ideas that if you had to put them in the movie, people might go to sleep. So I, I think it's a really good example of sort of magic and excitement that you can get in a book that don't always translate uh, to a movie. And uh, so, so, so that's one thing that, that came to mind. And then another thing, when you mentioned Ender's Game, because I read it a long time ago. I think I read it 10, 15, maybe more years ago. And I think one thing that's really interesting in Ender's Game is they really predicted the internet. You know, back back when I read it, there wasn't a way there where people in Florida and Washington DC could get together and have ideas and share ideas with millions of people they didn't know unless you worked for a big uh, newspaper or That's a TV awesome. station. And so I think that that was really smart. And now it's time for an interview of an interesting person. Today's guest is going to be so much fun. So today we have the one, the only, the awesome Russell Kins. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, Russell is a puzzle maker that has worked on video games and written an awards-winning book series called Samantha Spinner. That's right. <laughs> so first up. How are you enjoying being on the show? Well, this is a lot of fun, and it's kind of neat how you can meet people all over the world. And all I had to do was write a book. Wow. Okay, so you are the author of the Samantha Spinner series. I really enjoyed that series. Where did you get the idea to make secret doors all over the world? Well, that's actually something I came up with when I was your age. I remember really clearly when I was... Uh, in school, uh, fifth grade maybe? What grade are you, Tiberius? Fifth. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyways, I remember my parents taking me to see a play in a big fancy theater, and I was a little bored, and I started looking around, and I thought, wow, what was that shape on the wall? Does that do anything? And I thought, wow, was that a, a secret door? What if there was a tunnel? What if there was a staircase there? And I, I always had that idea. And so whenever I went someplace... I would try to imagine, what if that was a secret button? What if that was, what if that was a door that nobody else knew about? And, and cool. I made up all those ideas. And that's, and that's why I came up with the book as a, this whole Samantha Spinner story is a way to use that idea to introduce all sorts of other ideas of, about cool. really neat things around the world. Wow. So how long did it take to write the first book? Well, this is a scary story, if ever there was one. Uh, do you know, you might not like this answer. Uh, do you ever know anybody who says I'm going to do something and they never get around to finishing it? Well, I took like five years to write Samantha Spinner, which is terrible because I was Whole always series? saying I was no, the first book, because I was always kind of saying I was working on it and I never got around to finishing it. I would always get distracted by so some other fun finished. project. Yes. 
It is finished now. I've written four books in the series now, yeah, and there will be a fifth all. one. Well, there will be a fifth one that wraps it all up. I but knew I it! But that, but, hasn't, I knew it. that hasn't happened yet. And we're going to find out a lot of secrets Ooh. about some of the characters. Have you figured out the mystery of Missy Snodgrass yet? Well, I can't tell you. I can't tell you the answer because that would give things away. Spoiler alert. I'd like to tell you, but I can't. It's the uh, international rules of spoiler alertism prevent me from telling you the Is answer. That even a word? No, I just made it up. <laughs> so but I if really... you use it a lot, if you use it a lot, then maybe it becomes a word. Maybe. You can have it. My gift to you. Spoiler alertism. Wow. So I really like that you put puzzles in your books. How do you plan out the puzzles that you want your readers to solve? Well, for the most part, I, I, I add them towards the end because uh, the story comes first. The main thing, when I write a, when I write a, a, a Samantha adventure, which is, which is different from how I write some other books, the first thing I think about is where are they going to go? So for, for anybody else, if you don't know, Samantha has got an umbrella with a secret map of all the secret passageways and doors around the world. And each book, they go to different countries. So in the first book, they go to France and to Italy and to Egypt. And in the next book, they go to Peru and Indonesia and Mali, which is a country in Africa. And uh, so when I start to write a story, the very first thing I do is I say, hey, what countries are they going to next? And I'm really trying to go all around the world because a lot of kids already know about France. A lot of kids already know about Mexico, or Canada, but I really want to use this as an opportunity to introduce to pe people to places they don't, they may have heard of, but don't know a whole lot about, because that's really the point of my story. When I read that second book, I didn't know what, you know, the thing in, Africa was. I didn't even know what it was, which is really cool. So I learned something new in that book, which is really cool. So my dad said that you worked on Hooked on Phonics. I used that in school. Really? Give you the oh, idea that's great. To work on a program that taught kids to read better. Yeah, that was uh, that was my job for many years. I designed and wrote a lot of the books and the stories and and uh, videos and songs that are in Hooked on Phonics, and it's great. I feel like uh, you know I, I had a a little bit of a role in teaching lots and lots of kids how to how to read, you know. So that so that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. Now you've written over one hundred books. That's a lot. Which one are you most proud of? Hmm. Well, I really am proud of the first Samantha book mm -hmm. because it made a lot of kids laugh, and I get to to go around and and uh, and and talk to a lot of people about how to become a writer. So I think that's that's one of my favorites. And then I have a new one that I'm really excited about. I'm hoping maybe in a couple months you'll let me come back and, and tell you more about it. But it's a book of scary stories called Ooh. One, Two, Three, Scream. That and, looks uh, good. And uh, and again, it, it's got a lot of the, the same humor that's in the Samantha series. But mm. the stories are kind of scary. And really, really bad things happen to people. So uh, it's it's kind of fun. So I remember reading the first Samantha Spinner book. And it is, I'll tell you right now, it's so hard to make me laugh. Really, really hard. What? The first book made me laugh really, really hard. One thing that's really fun about writing uh, silly, silly adventures is writing bad guys and writing people who there's something kind of wrong with the way they think, because that's really the fun part of being a writer, because you can do and say things you that you would never, you yeah, that you would never actually say to someone and you would never actually do. But in a story, you can ha just be ridiculous. And, and that's why I have so much fun uh, writing things like Samantha. Mm -hmm. So what did you decide to write most of your books for kids? Um, partly I just love, uh, smart fun, you know, and, and a lot of times in kids books, you're allowed to be a lot sillier than you get to in, in other books. Now I love Ender, Ender's game and that's a really, there's not a lot of humor 
in it's Ender's Game. It's a great big, it's it's sci-fi, but you can have silly sci-fi, but True. it's a pretty serious book. I tend to, I like to make people smile. I like to surprise people with funny, funny language and funny laughs. So, uh, and so that's one of the reasons I'm really drawn to, uh, to kids books. It's, it's a chance to stay okay. playful and have fun, just like video games. Mm -hmm. I noticed that your books are on the accelerated reading list. How many books that I review are not even on the list? How did you get your books on the AR book list? Well, I don't get to decide that. That is up to librarians and teachers. Uh, they, they make those lists. And so when I give interviews and wow. when I go on websites and I try to tell people about the books and get the word out, but really it's up to librarians and teachers to find the books that they think are right for the kids that they work with. Wow. And I can't believe Ender's Game is on one. This is wow. our fifth grade. I sure am super honored to get even close to being on a list uh, with Ender's Game because that's a superb book. Mm -hmm. So how has being a puzzle book author made the world a better place? Well, I have a couple things because my books are really silly. I tell people this all the time. I say, my books are silly. They're full of smelly ninjas and and crazy clowns and true. pirates and uh, daredevils who make bad decisions. And uh, so they're really silly, but I do tell people that there is one point or maybe two, depending if you want this to be one or two points. But there are lots of amazing, interesting things all over the world that are real and you can explore them in person or you can explore them through characters in a story. And the other really important point I'm trying to make in these books are you shouldn't be afraid to meet people who don't look just like you. Smart. I mean, that's what I do. That's what I do every week. <laughs> Yeah, and I and I think that's that's uh, so so I think the thread that runs through all my books, whether it's a a little kid book or a puzzle book, it's it's about being positive, even uh, even scary stories where really horrible things happen to kids that maybe they didn't even deserve it. Uh, it's really about having fun and being silly, or being a, that it's okay to be silly and it's fun to be smart. Mm -hmm. So do you come up with puzzles all of the time or just when you're working? Every minute, all the time. And usually when it happens, it's because I wasn't paying attention and I get an idea. Like people say, where do your books, your stories come from? Or where do your ideas come from? And I think a lot of the time my, my ideas come from somebody said something or tells me about something they saw or did or read. And maybe I didn't hear it quite right. And then I think, Oh, oh, that's what you meant. And then I think, oh, but that thing I thought that they said, wouldn't it be neat if that was true? And then I write the story. So that happens a lot. Well, can you make up a puzzle with me in it? Oh, we're definitely going to put Tiberius in a puzzle at some point. There's no question. Or do you want something really, really bad to happen to a kid named Tiberius in a story? Sure. Maybe he gets sucked into a candy machine. Yeah, I love. Yeah, I, I love scary books. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I did that with my like uh, my new series, One Two Three Scream. It's all you know these little short horror stories. And the first thing I did uh, when I started writing it is I went on uh, on social media and I went to all my friends and I said, "Okay, who wants something really really bad to happen to them?" And uh, and I collected names, and that's why. Uh, <laughs> They all get uh, well, I'll dissolved. Go ahead and check out or, the name. Or, yeah, all sorts of horrible things happen to people with all my friends' names. And now it's quite possible that something really, really horrible is going to happen to a boy named Tiberius. Maybe his computer crashed and there's no one can fix it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just the beginning. Because then you think, what if that really happened? Then. He couldn't talk to anybody. And then he didn't know what time it is. And he had set up his whole world. So all his food and all his clothes and everything he orders through the computer. So now 
you know, and you just keep going. So, 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 so what you're hearing is how you make up a story. You think of, you start with a, what if you start with one thing and then you say, well, what could happen? And then of course there's the obvious thing that happens. Okay. The guys, Tiberius's computer stopped working, so he couldn't do this, this, and this. But then you say, what is the most interesting, ridiculous, horrible thing that could happen? And you make that happen. Wow. Well, my Maybe. dad said that you worked on some video games. I love video games. Which one's your favorite to work on? Hmm. Well, lately, I mostly have been working on educational games for like Dr. Seuss and Sesame Street. So they're probably not the kind of games that uh, that you're play playing that you're playing right now. I used to work for a company for a little bit called Valve, and I worked on like some some shoot 'em up games that yes. gives me. That gives me some uh, some street cred, but mostly, mostly I do educational games or fun games. I don't know if uh, if uh, you saw. I used to work for Nintendo, and I helped them write choose your own adventure books. And uh, so they were. I, do you know about choose your own adventure books? So it's like, if you think Mario and Luigi go go to the castle, turn to page seventy two. If you think they should go to the desert. Turn to page 15. And that's actually how I, I got involved in making games. I started uh, writing Choose Your Own Adventure books, and a friend of mine said, Russell, you're writing slow software. And that's when I started uh, getting involved in, in games. And uh, I, I designed a lot of levels, and I also wrote uh, music for, for a lot of Ooh. games. But I also you know specialize, because I, I do education, and storytelling, I, I do a lot of younger games, and, and that's how I wound up doing a Sesame Street and Hooked on Phonics and Dr. Education. Seuss. Education? But what was the one thing that when you started to work on this field that you did not expect? Well, I didn't expect how many pieces there are to a game. Like, if you pick any game that you like, it could be a small one on on Roblox, or could it be one of these big, what they, uh, they call them double A or triple A games. There are so many people testing and writing music and putting together the sound effects and the timing. And it's really more, they're as big as movies. You know, when you think of classic movies where you have thousands of people running around the set doing makeup and lighting and making sure the computers don't stop working and you have to go back and say the same thing over again. Well, um, games have that too. Mm-hmm. So what is the hardest part about being a puzzle-making author? Oh, well, I think not doing the same thing that you already did. Because a lot of times it's really easy to sort of reuse an idea and reuse an idea. And that's lazy. And so I think whether you're making a puzzle or a game or a story or a song, you always have to challenge yourself to, to come up with something new and not do something that everybody's seen before. Because that's too easy. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, whenever anybody says, oh, I have a story. I want you to read my story. In my mind, I think, oh, please, please don't be that he woke up and it was all a dream. Or, you know, that's, that's everybody writes that story. True. And it's like, you just got to get it out of your system. You got, so I, I always want to hear the third, the third thing that uh, that somebody writes because in the first two things it's always going to be and he woke up and it was always a dream or uh, Captain Kirk meets Captain Picard or all three Spider-Men get together in the same room because everybody has to sort of work that through get through their system mm -hmm. that's true so what advice would you give to my listeners if they want to grow up and make really cool puzzles hmm whether it's puzzles or stories or songs I, I sort of view it the same. It's about being creative and it's about doing a little bit every day. Cause you'll, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, I want to write a great big book like you, like one of these books, you know, it's 300 and some pages, Jeez, you know, maybe, uh, that. but, but, but no, I, I tell people don't try to write a big book if you've never written one before, because you'll never finish it. I always tell people write a little bit every day. It's just like if you had never been a runner and you wanted to run a marathon, you don't just put on your shoes and run 26 miles. 
you run a little bit, then you run a little bit further. And that's what I tell everybody who wants to be a game designer or a, a creative person. You just practice being creative every day. Start, write a poem, write a song, write a, write a postcard, write a letter to somebody else's dog. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and little by little, you'll build up. And then you'll be telling bigger stories and bigger ideas and bringing your reader along with you. Trust me, I love making video games. I mean, arcade video games. Literally, I made one for Valentine's Day. You are a heart and trying to collect people who, who are called lovers. <laughs> nice. So, collect 25, plays a song, boom, win. That's fantastic. Are you a songwriter as well? Well, it's only eight beats, so I had to make up a beat. It sounds pretty good, too. So, what was the hardest puzzle that you had to solve? Hmm, now, that's an important point. I'm good at making puzzles. I'm not really good at solving puzzles. All the time <laughs> people say, hey, smart guy, puzzle maker, let's see you solve this. And I say, I can't. I can't do that. Let's see that's you a solve different this skill. Maze. So, I actually don't try to go and make the hardest puzzles possible. I try to make the puzzle that gets people to think or laugh or advance a story. Uh, here, I, I brought a lot of little things for show and tell. I, like, I did this series recently called Puzzle Louis. And the idea is that you, uh, you read a chapter or two, and then at the end of each chapter, then you have to solve a puzzle. And wow. once you solve the puzzle, then it goes on to the next part of the chapter. story. Yeah, and, and I think that's really fun because it's a way of storytelling. So there's a lot of people who make crossword puzzles. That's a particularly tough puzzle to make because everything has to fit together just right. And I've done that once or twice, but that's like, that's a different skill. Like those are really hard to make unless you're specialized in crossword puzzle making. Um, but I really like to do um, puzzles that have a, you know, have an answer that makes you laugh or surprises you or tells a story. And that's how I put them in Samantha. And uh, uh, because there's a whole, if you've read the book, there's this extra little secret part of the story. We're finding out more and more about her evil neighbor, Missy Snodgrass, or who's really behind this big mystery. And so I like to use puzzles to sort of give you clues about mm -hmm. what's going on. And okay. then um, I did the same in, uh, in the horror stories because they seem like little horror stories but then there's also extra little things lurking in the lurking in between the I the lines that. of the story see that's good so what is the craziest thing that has happened while you were doing your passion hmm well uh one of the things that i'm really lucky when you when you have a book and it gets out there and lots of people are reading it you go you get to go visit schools and I, I don't want to say it's the craziest thing, but I love going out and, and meeting readers and getting their reaction because when you're a writer, everything that you're interested in goes in the book. I learn an interesting fact, I put it in the book. I see somebody do something funny, I change the name and I put it in the book. And so I'm thinking when, especially like I said, it's fun to write bad guys. So um, I was at a school and it was lots of like, it was a couple hundred kids, this huge, loud group of kids. And the principal came out and everybody was making noise and the principal held up a finger. And then the, the, uh, the principal went like that and everybody got quiet. And I thought that goes right in the book. And, uh, and I, so I had like the next book I wrote, the bad guy holds up a finger and yells at all her underlings and then they all get quiet. So I, I, I love collecting funny ideas. That's good. I didn't realize that. Wow. So I run a radio show and podcast that talks about God during my Lion Strong segment. How do you include God's message in your work? Well, I, I, I hope you get from, from hearing about my, my stories I and, and my books and my games, everything I try to do I try to have to add some po to be positive. And I, and I really think that's, that is my angle. I tell people if, if I have one personal goal and all this stuff is to spread a little bit of joy. I never 
think so much of myself that I'm doing great, fantastic things by by writing my stories. You know, I I, I want to, you know, contribute positively to the world. And so I think mm -hmm. even even you know with the bad guys who do you know the smelly ninjas who are out to do crimes or like I mentioned my my horror stories where really awful things happen I still there's always a thread of a positive point you no know, I don't have stories where just awful things happen for no reason unless there's a little bit of a point so I think exactly. I think that's my my personal my personal goal and it's a it's a small goal okay now i've already reviewed all of the samantha spinner books on my show oh no which of your books should i do you think i should read next to review um well other than samantha well i if you can't tell i'm really hoping you will I review that book. one two three scream yeah, yeah. Although if you go to the I'll website, I'll give my dad to go buy it. Trust me. <laughs> if you go to the website, it says very, very clearly, "Do not read this book." What was the biggest mistake you ever made, and how did it change you as a person? Hmm. I need a second to think about that answer. <laughs> Goes out. What is the biggest mistake I ever made and how does it change me as a person? Um, I will tell you, uh, I don't know how it changes a person, but I have some real regrets that there is so much time between book four and book five in my series that I feel like I've kind of abandoned my characters. And it makes me really sad because at the very end of book four, uh, the dog gets kidnapped and yeah. the uncle is still gone and then the mom vanishes and the sister's play closes on broadway and there's like and the house is stolen and, exactly. and like 20 different bad things happen and i did that on purpose because i wanted to make a super cliffhanger but i didn't realize that how it, much work that would be well and i didn't realize that there was going to be this other books that were going to come out and then i had to work on them for a while way before the publisher was going to come out with the next samantha book so like right now even though they're my made up characters what i feel like called? i feel like they're out there somewhere and uh, so i feel really like that was a mistake okay okay now can you tell me that one story you know remember this is a kid show but that one story well that you're not supposed to tell me about. Come on, you can tell me. You mean the secrets in the book that I can't tell you? Remember, what, what is it called? I don't know. Just... That would violate the rules of spoiler alertism. <laughs> so I think I can't tell you that. See, but it can be anything, like embarrassing story. Oh, embarrassing, embarrassing stories? No, but I'll show you a funny story instead. I'm going to show you this. This is something I made that, or I invented that never got made. And I, so I brought this for show and tell. This is the one and only book in the can. And, and I, uh, I invented this for Hooked on Phonics because they wanted to come wow. up with a book that kids could take in the bathtub and books could read, put in a cup holder in a car. So I invented book in a can. And, uh, and the idea is that you turn the, you turn the pages. Oh, wow. And it's all again. And, uh, and, that, and this not only did it not get made, but for a variety of reasons, it's never going to get made. But uh, it's fun. So I have the one and only copy of Book in a Can. Book in a Can. Because you know kids would rip that off. <laughs> yeah. You know kids would destroy them. It would be destroyed. It was turned out it was just too fragile. Uh, and so it's just, uh, and then it's a choking hazard because it's got all these little parts in there and you don't want... You know, because it's made for like kids who read like books like, you know, little board books. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why you're never going to see it. It's got a lot of little parts and it's meant for little kids. And so uh, there's it's called choking hazard. And yep. uh, it's also uh, a lot of a lot of plastic and people are getting a little smarter about not uh, polluting as much. So for for this and many other reasons, know. you'll never see another book and it can. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else you think my listeners should know about you? Um, well, 
I think I've said this several times, but I'm hoping that some of you guys go to one, two, three, scream and, yeah. uh, and check out my new horror stories, which are coming out. And maybe if I'm lucky, you'll, uh, let me come back and try to scare some people this fall. Uh, cause that would be a lot of fun. Mm, that's a good question. Well, do you have a website or Facebook for my listeners who want to follow you? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I have, two websites now because I have two book series. So you can go to samanthaspinner.com and find out about not just the book series, but there's videos and puzzles. And then uh, just just launched uh, 123scream.com. Let me Look read it. The numbers one, two, three, three scream. Three. And, uh, and then you can start, uh, there's all sorts of scary puzzles. Ooh, types it up. What well, would be, I want you to help me though. I'm working on some extra scary puzzles. What would be a great scary answer for a puzzle? Tell me what the puzzle would be. Well, I'm doing, you know, I do all sorts of things. I mean, these are really ridiculous, scary stories. So something like there's all about, I have all these chapters about how birds are going to get you. Don't go outside ever because there's a bird and he's always watching you. And so, uh, I do a lot of puzzles about like the secret. Have you ever heard about the raven? What Imagine if the raven? bird was a raven, and uh, he was sitting on your roof, yeah. waiting for you to walk out. Mm. But if you walk out, he would just snatch. That's really good. I kind of like a raven with a whip, or a zombie raven. What about tentacles? Can ravens oh, have tentacles? They keep them tucked, smart. tucked in underneath their wings, exactly. and so you don't know about it. But it's exactly, a... mutated yeah. raven. Yeah. Yeah, that's really an important thing we have to worry about. <laughs> well, what is the one question that you think I forgot to ask you? Hmm, what did you forget to ask me? Uh, you Did you ask me, what's my favorite book title of all the books I've written? Well, what and is I, it? I don't have it here, but you can see it on the back of this book. I love telling people that I wrote a book called, Is There a Chance You've Seen My Pants? I think that's just a funny title. So a lot of times when I go to a presentation or a school, I say, hi, I'm an author. I wrote a book called, Is There a Chance You've Seen My Pants? Because it, it sounds like some sort of a self-help book that's gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Russell, for being my special guest. Can you stick thank around you. the math corners? Oh, hey, oh, my dogs are asleep. I was going to bring my dogs over and hold them up at the camera, but they're... Uh, they're not cooperating, so you get just me. Woof. Good. Thank you. Midstate Fire has been providing top quality fire equipment services for three generations to the Central Florida area. Don't wait for an emergency to repair. Call Midstate Fire today at 407 246 8855. Get your fire extinguishers and emergency lighting for both your home and businesses by visiting www.midstatefire.com. That number again is 407-246-8855. Tiberius' favorite subject, it's Math Corners! Well, thank you so much, Russell, for your help with Math Corners. Last week, we talked about two-step equations, and, well, we did a word problem. I'm not a fan of the word problems. So, they're kind of like puzzles, so... You know my God gave me yet another one. Okay, here we go. Jenny makes quilts. She can make seven quilts with 21 yards of material. How many yards of material would be required to make 12 quilts? Well, that's easy. I just take the 21 yards and divide it by se seven quilts, get three yards per quilt, then times it by 12 and get 36. Then my dad said that that's the kid's way to do it, or basically my way. So I have to do it with algebra. Oh boy, that means I have to make an equation and prove it. Okay, so I go to work on the equation. So we know that 21 divided by seven is the amount of yards per quilt needed. And we know that we have to multiply that by the number of quilts to be made. So my equation would be 12 times 21 over 7 equals x. So 12 times 21 is 252. And say 252 divided by 7, you get 36. See the same answer, but longer way. Well, 
have you considered the fact that you didn't mention or nobody talked about why is she making those quilts? And what is she making those quilts out of? Maybe there's something going on with those quilts. There's a whole extra level. Maybe there's a three-step puzzle here. Maybe there's a three-step problem here. And that whole quilt is part of a bigger problem. Maybe there's a secret pattern in the quilt. And if you can solve it by looking at it, that it'll help you find a way to find a secret door. And that'll take you to Venezuela. It's possible. Possible. <laughs> then my dad started to change how many quilts was desired. And I saw why the equation was useful. You could change any value and quickly still solve the sol problem. So Russell, do you know all about solving two-step word problems? Um, yes, but that's the challenge. A lot of people don't like uh, word problems because they, they, they just hear all the words and they get stuck. But the trick is to hear what's important and to break it down to simple numbers. And then you can solve any problem. Mm -hmm. Well, my teacher says that I would use math every day. Do you have to use math in your job? Well, actually, yes. I don't have to do you know, really uh, complicated problems, but because I'm always doing something with hidden messages or shapes, I use math and logic all the time. So uh, like right before I talk to you today, I'm working on a puzzle with eyeballs because I'm making puzzles for my, uh, my scary story One, two, story three, book. scream! Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, in it, if you look at uh, all the eyeballs, there's letters mm. In, in the eyeballs with with different uh, with a different message, and if you solve that message, it tells you how to solve a different message. Ooh, and then if you solve that cutie. message, there's something. So so I don't necessarily use a lot of advanced math, but I'm always looking for a way to add in a layer of puzzles and a layer of fun. But I'm doing it just for fun. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Russell, for your help with math corners. <laughs> And now it's time for the heart of a lion. As you know, we talk about the qualities of living by the heart of a lion, which stands for leadership, integrity, obedience, and nobility. Well, this week, we're going to talk about leadership. For me, I think leadership is the act of loving what is good, having self-control, and being disciplined. Well, the qualities of leadership are providing guidance and direction, organization, and being a positive influence on others. I saw leadership in my dad's Monday morning meeting. He met with a bunch of people, and the head guy, Johnny Dunn, was talking about being the best version of yourself. He asked a lot of questions about what do we want on our tombstone, and how do we want to be remembered. Well, he was providing guidance and direction, as well as helping people to come up with a positive attitude toward who they want to be and how, to, how they want to treat others in the world. So, Russell... Did you see or use leadership at all this week? Well, when you went over the, the pieces of what LION stands for, leadership, integrity, obedience, and nobility, I really stopped on being a positive influence. I think that is the most a attainable uh, characteristic that everyone can strive for every day. And uh, I think about that because we're living in a time where it's so easy for people to lash out and say things that don't need to be said or find the one thing that divides us or blames. You know, we all have problems and everybody can blame problems on somebody else. So I, I think that being a positive influence, uh, bridging, uh, finding common uh common interests and common beliefs, even if uh, people are very different from you, that that's what I think is actually uh, the most important thing. Uh, you know, I, so uh, so that that's what jumps out at me when I hear you talk about lying. Mm -hmm. Well, we should always try and be lying strong in everything we do, shouldn't we? Yes. And we should always try to be positive and find good in people who we may or may not agree with. Over 40 years, Playhouse Central Florida has provided education, independent life skills, and job training to thousands of Central Floridians who live with blindness or any degree of vision loss. Whether it's picking out clothes in the morning or just moving around your community and serving Orange, Seminole, and Osceola counties, 
contact White House, Southern Florida at 407-898-2483 or visit them online at lighthousecfl.org. And that's our show, folks. I want to thank the one, the only, the amazing Russell Gaines. Well, thank you for having me. For being on my show. It has been so much to talk to you today. I think we learned about the world of being a puzzle and game maker, as well as how to get your ideas on paper. And on the screen, and in the little cartridge. Mm. Also, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at The Tiberius Show, and please be sure to visit The Tiberius Show on YouTube and like and subscribe. Also, be sure to listen to us next week on The Tiberius Show with your host, Tiberius! Bye!